welcome to part two. This is our Q&A on the Seawind 1260. As many of you probably know, we have been living on board this 1260 for some time. We chose to kind of use the 1260 as like an interim boat between Ruby Rose, our 38 foot monohull, and Ruby Rose 2, which will be our Seawind 1370, which will be a 45 foot catamaran. So this is a 42 foot catamaran. A nice little stepping stone um, while we wait for Ruby Rose 2 to be built. We have had so many questions about the 1260 and it was one of our favorite boats at Annapolis uh, 2019 when we reviewed it for the first time so we were so excited to get a chance to actually live on board and sail this boat kind of quite intensively um, that was a real opportunity that we were very excited about so we wanted to share our thoughts and our findings with you guys our patrons came up with some amazing questions they always come up with the best questions so this is a Q&A format part one I will link to up here um, go check that out if you haven't already watched it and uh, otherwise let's just dive right into um, our first couple of questions. We are still talking about uh, sailing performance and comfort underway which is where we left off last episode. Let's just go straight for it. So Paul and Francis Corrigan who actually have just bought a C1260, it was completed not long ago, they're waiting for it to be delivered. Um, so congratulations guys, I'm um, really excited for you. How has the boat performed and specifically what about kind of speed versus wind strength as in what kind of speeds boat speeds have we had in what kind of wind conditions so um when we haven't been in protected waters i think on the wind i think we got the boat will sail at about 50 55 degrees mm. i think that's probably you know and she sails well that you can get it to about 45 but it does start to laugh a little bit um and honestly this is just the conditions we've been in um we would need to test sail it for a lot a lot longer but we've had eight knots out of this boat oh, yeah. easily mm. um Eight, eight and a half knots in um, kind of 15 to 20 knots of breeze off the wind. Mm. We don't have any colored sails on here, so it's impossible to do light wind performance. It's a very difficult thing to quantify because this boat has a lot of kit on it. We probably would have less kit on it mm. to try and kind of keep the weight down. And as I said, probably slightly cruelly in, in other review videos, you know, light wind performance is really where you kind of want to where you could where you really want to a boat will excel but we don't have the sails on this boat to kind of like to actually test that no but i would say in kind of seven knots of wind we'd be doing like four and a half five knots yeah seven knots four and a half and that's as i said we've said a few times wouldn't it be great if we just had like a really good reaching sail yeah there, yeah like a high quality laminate reaching so because the boat would fly mm. and you can just you, you know you can feel her pick up and you yeah know, so yeah no problems with performance at all she's not sluggish she also tracks really well through the water um, I've seen catamarans before, they just literally, they're just doing this all yeah. the time. This thing, it tracks. Yeah. So yeah, I'm pretty happy with, with the performance. Yep. But Bill, we, we're bringing another video out shortly. Um, we, you may have already seen it, but um, I don't know when it's gonna be scheduled about the specification on Ruby Rose 2. And we are gonna be talking a lot about the sails that we've, we're putting on that boat, precisely for this reason. Good quality upwind sails, good quality just general the light, light wind sails. yeah light wind sails mm. but also the white sails next question by Paul and Cheryl Shard of Distant Shores <laughs> um, you guys may I've already know of them um, they've got a great selling channel um, go check them out Distant Shores if you haven't already done so um, okay they ask a really great question which is something that we were thinking about a lot before we decided to make the move from on a hole to catamaran which is do you get less tired on the catamaran and as as part b is it an adjustment to sail by instrument instruments versus the boat responding to the wind so i'll, I'll answer the first bit and you can answer the second um do you get less tired i have found it less tiring definitely physically it is less tiring because you know on a monohull you do tend to get thrown around a lot um, depending on the conditions and even when you're not kind of being thrown around. When you're on a hill, your all of your kind of muscles are tense and engaged trying to kind of hold you upright. So it can be physically very tiring. Um, the other thing is that when you are on a boat and this isn't specific to monohulls in general, this was our boat, Ruby Rose. Um, she was a 38 foot monohull, she is a 38 foot monohull, um, and she was very heavy, not 
because of any fault of her own, but just because after years of living on board, we weighed her down. There was so much stuff on that boat. So she did not have the best performance. And so, you know, for example, a 50 mile day would take us like 10 hours, you know, maybe sometimes even longer. So there were long sailing days. Whereas when you are on a, any boat that sails well or performs well, um, you know, in, in um, particularly in light winds is nice, but you know, we're talking more specifically about performance catamarans and this catamaran in particular, you do get to your destination faster because you are going faster. And that is really nice. So that makes you less tired as well. You know, we've been at anchor and it's tiring as well, so. True, that's very true. Yes, so um, being at anchor, that's actually a good point because I mean, anyone who's spent a rolling night at anchor on a minor hole knows exactly what I'm talking about. You're probably having flashbacks right now. You are physically tired because you are always having to adjust to the movement of the boat um, but also sometimes you're tired just because you can't sleep because the boat is rolling around so much we've been in a lot of anchorages in this boat and some of them have been pretty lively bouncy um, a lot of wake particularly from um, traffic in the harbor uh, from the ferries in particular and um, honestly it's not been a problem at all the second part of the question that paul and cheryl ask is about how how does it feel to actually sail by numbers you can feel when a monohull is in its groove yeah like literally it kind of like you know the boat sits and this is why you know modern boats modern monohulls in the last maybe 10 years start putting chimes on you know Genoa doing that a lot now because the boat will just sit on that chime and it goes and so it is you do feel that more um, and you can't replace that on on a catamaran however and this is where me continually banging on about keeping your catamaran lightweight comes in. When you are sailing a catamaran, which is light and has got a big rig on it, while you can't feel it healing, the acceleration on those things is insane. Mm. And this boat, as I said, doesn't have colored sails in it. But I've sailed, I, I sailed um, a Nutrimo 51 that was, it wasn't stripped out, but it was, it was light. Mm and they put a big uh, code zero on that thing. And the thing went up unfurled, the damn thing just shot off. So light catamarans that sit on the water where they're not weighed down with your Instapots and your kind of like your Nutri blenders or whatever they're called, um, with a good set of sails on, you can partly offset the lack of feeling because you're not in a monohull with this insane acceleration that you just don't get from a, a monohull unless it's a rate, you know, maybe in a J boat or something like mm. that. Yeah, it was definitely something that we had to get um, used to kind of selling, um, not just by numbers, but also, and this is the first thing that I noticed when we first put the sails up, is that you feel, you do feel um, a disconnect from the sails at first. And then you, I feel like I've kind of gotten used to it. But, you know, in um, a monohull, you are, like the sails are right in your face like there's no separation between the cockpit and the sails really um it's all kind of right there in front of you whereas um on this catamaran you've got the bimini the hard top bimini and you do have um like windows in the the bimini so you can see the sails but you have to like walk over to them and look up so you have to be proactive in other words you have to be proactive in looking at the sails, um, at the main sail, you can obviously see the jib just by looking forward. And so that's a difference. I guess that's the big difference is on a monohull, you, you don't have to be proactive because the main sail is right in front of you. When we first, I agree with you, when we first got on this boat, we got the sails up and we're like, um, Where's the sail? <laughs> can't see what's going on, boat going round, going, going forward. But I think now I'm used to the wind and I'm, I kind of know where to put yeah. my head to check. Yeah. Um, and I think what I'm trying to do is compensate for the lack of sensation by checking more. Maybe less intuitive. You kind of, as as Paul and Cheryl say, you have to like look at the wind speed and yeah. think, okay, now I have to reef. Yeah. Whereas on a monohull, you can feel, you can yeah. definitely feel when it needs yeah. to be reefed. The next one um, is related. So Stephen Hall asks, how much time on watch is spent at the external helm station compared to the internal nav station? Um, now this, 1260 has a different setup to the 1370. Um, the 1370 has a forward-facing nav station with a um, like a, a 
chair and this has a nav station which is not forward facing and you have to sit on the actual settee so i would argue that um it is probably going to be much more convenient for us to be sitting inside at the internal nav station the forward facing nav station on ruby rose 2 than it would be here the only point the only points of reference i can give you about the a nav station that i would want and it really was something that we desperately wanted in the in the in the seawind 1370 was a forward facing nav station for this reason if you look at boats that have a forward facing nav station um seawind 1600 is a good example that has amazing visibility yeah. and it's got a reasonably comfortable chair uchimera 51 has forward facing nav station and i think that at the point that you can comfortably sail a boat from the inside with autopilot control and being able to see the set of your sails yeah at that point you know life gets easy life gets mm. pretty easy it's nice to be outside during the day yeah it is if, if the weather's lovely mm. you want to be out there yeah if the weather's not so nice then you have to do the best for what with what you have to make the best of what you've got and that really again it depends on what you're doing example you know if you're just doing a day sail and the weather's awful you just get on with it yeah you know you're like oh, it'll be over soon <laughs> monohull sailors were like well just get your wet weather gear on yeah get your wet weather gear on suck it up tether yourself on and off you go mm. i think that from our point of view we would we would just we would sail from in here yeah if the weather was really bad um and obviously if you need to reef you need to get you go outside so i think forward facing nav station will be will get a lot more use in a side facing nav station because you can sit and literally you have your instruments in front of you and then you've got the view in front of you yeah on this there's no instruments here although you can turn that pod around so you can, you can see everything from there yeah this here having a, a big plot of there um and an autopilot control and that comfortable helm seat and being able to look forward we'll report back with uber rose too but i think we'll probably spend a fair bit of time inside helming next question by sean and jerry which is a really good one um how is it particularly for someone of shorter stature i'm five foot two um getting to the boom access to the boom um and to the main cell and also getting up onto the coach roof so access to the main was something that we talked about quite a lot in our reviews and mm -hmm. how easy it was to get up there and how safe it would be um particularly obviously in a seaway i mean when you're at anchor or you're tied up to a the dock then you know it doesn't really you, you'll be able to get up there eventually even if there's not many kind of natural handholds but when you are underway and particularly if um it's a little bit um, you're in some weather and you know that there's kind of quite a bit of motion to the boat then you want to be able to get up there very safely and easily um, because let me tell you if you're up there in that kind of weather then there's a very good reason why you're up there the c 1260 has um a step um, on the side and then there's the shrouds right there to hold on to if you can stand on your hard bimini life becomes pretty simple for most people, it's the sail bag. That's why you're up yeah. there. You're up there unzipping or zipping your sail bag. On this boat, once I'm up on that coach roof, the boom is at waist height. Yeah. So literally, I look down onto the sail bag. Yeah. Right, let's move on to engines. So uh, first of all, uh, Nick Bunny asks, how is the engine access? Uh, it's excellent. Uh, it's, I think this kind of run is slightly different because um, many catamarans that you see at boat shows, I think most of them, have access in the transoms. Yeah. This is, there's no access in the transoms here. You actually go through the inside of the boat. Yeah. And I've had to go in there a few times when we've been at sea just to empty the holding tank, which is also stored in there. No, no problem at all. Uh, access has been absolutely fine. The, it's a 42 foot boat and the, I think the 39 horsepower Yamaha's in there. There's still enough room around there to, to get all the stuff done. And I would far, far prefer to have engine access in the inside because if you want to access your engine, you don't want to be on the outside because that's either because you're doing routine maintenance or something's wrong uh, and that's probably going to happen at sea. Yeah. Is the 1370, that's got access from both times, yes, isn't it? So yeah. you can access it from the transom and from the yes. inside. Yeah. Um, okay, a question that I undenied over whether we should include or not, but I've it's done not, it. It's not like the beds again, is it? <laughs> no. What are you talking about? What else might you need a bit of head height in the bedroom for? The fact that you can't... Archery? <laughs> Archery? Taking a brace of pheasants and hanging them up? Oh. <laughs> That's what the hatch is for. 
No, we, we've left that one far behind. Yeah, that's going to be uh, bleeped out. Yep, carry on. Yep. So John Kramer asked a question that we've been asked quite a lot, so that's why I included it. What are our thoughts regarding shaft, shaft drive versus sail drive? I think, just quickly, before Nick gets into a more technical explanation, unfortunately, if that's your red line, you are going to be very, very limited with which catamaran you can buy because there are very few catamarans that are being built now, modern catamarans, um, that use shaft drives. I think the Antares is the only one. I feel like there's another one where you can option a shaft drive. Maybe the new St. Francis or the new Balance, I'm not it sure. It was one of them. Someone comment down below yeah. and, rem and remind us. There is one, and the option is, it's really expensive. And that's why they're all sail drives because the shaft drives are just very expensive. There's really other reasons as well. I think that the principle of, 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 of shaft drives is, is probably there's a smaller hole in the boat. I think that's probably, there's a smaller hole in the engine bay rather than using diaphragm for the sail drive. But every boat just about is like that now. Mm. The other thing is, you know, if you're trying to balance a boat, having a sail drive on underneath your engine allows you to put the weight in one place. Whereas, you know, if you've got a shaft drive, you bring the engine further forward. And I think with the Antares, um, they are further forward. Yeah. And that's not always gonna be yeah, possible when you're designing a boat. They are also more difficult to align. But overall, if I had the choice, if I could tick, if I could tick a box and say, what would I want? I'd probably want shaft just because it's a smaller hole that you have in the boat. Um, yeah, as Nick says, the, the, the labor, it costs a lot more because the labor, of, I believe, of the labor involved in, in- It's getting it all aligned, making yeah. sure that everything's sorted out. And it is kind of technology and a system that, that really existed and exists on monohulls. Yeah, and at sail drive you just like plonk it in and it's there. The only, um, I think the main disadvantage, um, as far as I understand, please comment down below with your thoughts, by the way, because certainly I've never had to deal with this before, is um, that the diaphragm on sail drives, there historically have been some maintenance issues with that. Um, but my understanding is that essentially if you keep an eye on it, then, and you change it up every, X no, how many years? Like five years. I don't or know. Something? I hope seven years uh, right. as a maintenance cycle on sail drive. And you ha and the thing about it is, you know, I think people worry about them. Mm. And the other thing about it is, you know, people think, you know, again, are concerned about, you know, can you puncture the sail drive? Um, I think most modern production boats now have sail drives. Yeah. So the vast, vast majority. Yeah. Sean and Jerry, who have had many good questions, um, has another one right now. Coming from a monohull, um, how have you found the additional space? I don't know. I would say that we, we've only used half the boat. We don't use, we haven't used the starboard half of that boat at all. Apart from the galley, but there's, there's two other cabins yeah. we haven't used. We don't really, uh, yeah, it's, there is more space than we need. Oh yeah, for like sure. Like far more space Way more. Like. We've, we're used to living on a 38 foot monohull. Yeah, all I would say, um, the one thing is, and it's because the galley in here is, is galley down, and it, the, the holes are narrow to get the performance. Yeah. It's difficult for two people to, one person to get past the other person in the galley. In the galley, yeah. Only the galley is a one person at a time yeah. thing. Yeah, but true. you can shimmy past each other. That's annoying. <laughs> yeah, but, but no. There, it there, annoys me. <laughs> there is an, there is an, a, an outrageous amount of space on this yeah. boat compared yeah. to what we had. Yeah. And, and the next question, which I think we've already answered very succinctly, um, Roger Cox, is the overall living space adequate? <laughs> yeah. More than adequate, Roger. Absolutely yeah. more than yeah. adequate. Yeah. It's, um, it's it, fantastic. It, I mean, look. Glibly, I've said before that Catarine is a little bit like, you know, it's a transition between a house and a boat. But it is, you know, especially at anchor. Like we essentially go around our, about our lives at anchor like we would at home. Like yeah. the TV goes on, we're not worried about power. Yeah. You know, it's it's pretty, yeah, it's pretty, pretty it's easy. Pretty nice, yeah. Yes. Okay, next question. Also from Roger. Is, this, is the 1260 strong enough to withstand heavy weather conditions? Yes. The way that these boats are built, and again, we've had the theory from Antoine We've seen them being built. We talked to Sea Wind, and now we've been on one. They feel really, they do feel really solid. Really solid. So, vinyl ester, foam core, crash bulkheads, everything that, fi you know, shelving fiberglass in, so structural stuff, they, they feel solid. Oh yeah. You can tell just instinctively that this boat is really well built. There is not a single squeak. We have been, 
at sea in fairly lumpy conditions where the boat was slamming, like really being tossed around. But apart from that, there was no real noise coming from the there boat. Is that nice. There's that none of, and the thing is, you know, coming from Ruby Rose, like Ruby Rose, I was just thinking about this the other day, like some of the floor panels squeaked. Yeah, when you walked around. So there's, there's literally, there's not a squeak on this boat. There, yeah. is, there is no extraneous noise. Yeah, which brings me neatly on to the next question, which is, uh, from Andrew. Is the 1260 suitable for an Atlantic crossing or sailing Biscay? Um, so obviously I'm assuming Andrew you're in the UK or Northern Europe, but I think we can extend that to is the 1260 suitable for offshore passages in general? Yeah, but there's, these boats have circumnavigated. Yeah, I mean a hundred percent. Like there is, yeah. you would, I would rather be in this catamaran than almost any other catamaran, you know, like there's... No, I'm, I'm, I have full confidence in it. And I, I, you know, a lot of you could be sitting there going, oh, well, you're getting a sea wind, so therefore you're just, you're championing sea wind. No, no, that's not the case. If there was a problem with this boat, you'd know about it. I have genuinely zero qualms about taking this boat offshore. No, absolutely not. But I will just clarify that the reason why we're getting a sea wind is because we went on board the 1600 and then we went on board the 1260 and we fell in love with the 1600 and the 1260. We, like these, the sea wind kind of lineup was our favorite of all the boats that we saw. If the 1370 wasn't in the works, would we have opted for a 1260? That's a really tough question to answer because, as I said, we went on to the 1600 in April 2019 at La Grande Motte. We loved the 1600 so much, like we were blown away. We were not, we did not have any expectations. We'd never been on a sea wind before. Um, we'd barely even heard of sea wind catamarans. Um, and so we kind of just like jumped on board thinking, oh, I wonder what this kind of run's like. And we were like, wow, this boat is fantastic. We were really, really impressed. The 1600, we kind of knew straight away, um, although it took us a little while to accept that it was just going to be too big for us. I mean, it's, you know, a 52 foot catamaran and going from 38 foot monohull, we were just, it was just stretching ourselves just further than what we were comfortable with. So when we got to Annapolis that year uh, in October, um, so about six months later, we came on to the 1260 with the expectation that perhaps this would be a good fit for us. However, it was always in the back of our minds that maybe it wouldn't be quite perfect. Maybe it wouldn't tick all the boxes because we knew that we really wanted about a 45 foot catamaran. And that wasn't just like an arbitrary figure that we came up with. That was where we truly believed that the sweet spot would be between kind of um, something that was pretty fast, but also something that had good storage um, for kind of remote cruising and long, long distance um, cruising, ocean passages, that kind of thing. Um, and also that we could that would take a higher payload because a smaller catamaran, you can't put as much stuff on, um, which, okay, we'd, we like to think that we're minimalists, but at the end of the day, this will be our home. So we wanted a boat that would be kind of big enough to manage a little bit of extra weight. We also really wanted for our ocean crossings to have four other crew on board and then you know two of us so six in total because we had had four people on board ruby rose for an atlantic crossing before and um that was a nice number but it was too big for that boat a 38 foot monohull it was, it was too big uh, too many people for that boat and we kind of had this idea in our mind and we still have it that having two couples or at least you know two people willing to share a cabin and a bed would be ideal that would give us kind of five people, five crew plus the skipper. Yep. And we really wanted that set up because it would give everyone loads of sleep. It would give Nick the ability to not have to do watches, to just do concentrate on his skipper duties, which are a 24 hour day job. And so therefore the aft cabin on the 1260 just felt a little bit too small for that purpose. And we also suspected that we would actually have to use the aft cabin for some storage space. So there were just a few issues with the 1260 that made it not quite perfect for our purposes. That being said, it's hard to know what we would have done if um, this 1370 weren't, wasn't- I This would have made the shortlist. I, I still think that we, the 45 foot plus is where I want to be just for waterline speed. Yeah. And for storage. And for storage. I, because we, we have, specific needs and that is going to be you know we want to go through panama we want to end up in the south pacific pretty soon after we get this boat if that's where we go you know so we are going to be remote living mm -hmm. and 
we need to keep stuff, you know, quite a lot of stuff in Waterloo. Mm. So yes, it would have definitely made the shortlist. And but if we'd been doing an Atlantic circuit or a, a European circuit, a Mediterranean circuit, yes, this would have been it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. So that's it from our questions from our patrons. Um, but I wanted to talk about um, our kind of favourite things about this boat, um, and perhaps one thing that we would like to ideally change about this boat, just to round out the conversation. I'll just pick one thing that I love. Tell me. Okay. So my favorite, my abs, well, actually this is really hard, but I think that my favorite feature of this boat, bearing in mind that I love this boat, if I had to pick one thing, it is these big opening hatches behind me. They are like the most amazing thing. And I knew, I always knew that ventilation was super important, um, particularly when you're living in kind of or when you're sailing in like warm climates and the tropics, which we have done quite a bit of, but they have really just come into their own while we've been on this boat. Yeah. We've, we've had all sorts of weather. We've had really cold and rainy weather like today, but we've had also like really sweltering weather. Um, and opening up these big hatches, uh, it just brings that breeze in and it just feels, it feels like you're sitting outside, but protected and inside, if that makes sense. I, I love them. What I do not love, I think that the, not that I want to revisit this conversation, <laughs> but. Is, the, it the, is it the headroom? The headroom. <laughs> the headroom in the cabin. I did mention a lot in the reviews that I felt that if you're living on a boat, then being able to um, make the bed, it sounds so stupid and small, but being able to access like both sides of the bed and being able to make the bed relatively easily, I think is fairly important. It takes me several minutes to make the bed. So the headroom in the cabin um, is a little bit of a logistical issue. Is it a red line for me having lived on this boat for some time now? Absolutely not. I would happily deal with it. You know, I mean, whatever, like I'd be totally fine with it. But perhaps if you have mobility issues, then it might be something that you think about. Things that I would, I, I don't like, that nav table, that nav station, I, having it at 90 degrees, I'd rather, it, to me, I just can't get my head around it. I yeah. want to be able to look forward and navigate. Yeah. That's, that's that, it. And that's right. I guess the point about nav station is that nav stations can, in certain boats, including monohulls, be a watch keeping station. And you keep watching that. Mm. It is going to be pretty, I, it, I think the fact that it's at it's it's at 90 degrees to the way you that you're watch you're yeah. watching. I know you could spin yourself around, but I think to to be there and keeping watch forward awkward, not awkward, but more tiring. I would I I would prefer a forward facing nav station. And that was something that we talked about a lot in our reviews. Yeah. We talked about it all the time how that's what we wanted. Yeah, yeah. And, and we've talked extensively sea wind for the 1370 forward facing nav station. So that 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 problem you mm. know that doesn't go away. What do I love about this boat? That door. It's the best. From the point of view of design, the whole thing goes up. It folds away pretty easily. It's all kind of locked in place. And so when it's sunny, even when it's warm at night, you have a huge amount of space, like a crazy amount of space for such a small boat. Mm. Um, so you can wander around, it's comfortable, you know, so you have a lot of space. And I think even if you have four people living on this, you know, with the areas you've got, they've got a massive area here, this modular furniture, big area out there, the two helm seats that kind of like go forward backwards with the, yeah. and then there's a trampoline out there. Yeah. They're literally, there's loads of areas. So many, so many seating options. So that from the point of view of the amount of space, but I guess the whole thing is it, it, it this is kind of 20, 21st century living, having this kind of indoor outdoor space. And there's so many bits that, you know, for instance, the barbecue area and the, the sink area out there, there's a lot of kind of like the functionality that would traditionally be inside, now outside. Mm. So that's what I love. I love this trifold door. It kind of gives you this, this the amount of the way that they've worked with the space here. Yeah. That's what I love. So there you go. So listen, um, that was part two of our, our just our kind of review of the Seawind 1260 from the point of view of, of kind of having spent a, a, some time aboard now. By the end of this year, Ruby Rose 2 should be launched and we'll be kind of, you know, exploring that and taking you through all that. And we're going to have lots of videos coming out about, the, you know, the development, the build, 
um, as soon as we get into Vietnam, we'll be filming that as well. So hope you enjoyed that one. Please feel free to subscribe to the channel. There's a little click box down there. There's a lot more technical information that we're filming and we'll bring to you about all aspects of sailing, not just multi-hull sailing, but mono-hull sailing. So thank you for watching. We'll see you again really soon. Goodbye. Goodbye.